Welcome Ling 101 students to this screencast where I'm going to go over a, a problem, the Oneida problem that's on page 44 and 45 of the study guide. Just while you're getting out a pen and paper or the study guide to look through that problem, I'll tell you a little bit about the language of Oneida. This is a North American indigenous language that belongs to the Iroquoian family of languages. The map shown here is of Iroquoian languages prior to European contact. Um, Oneida itself started out um, in New York State and then in the early 1800s New York State was trying to annex the lands that the Oneida people were on so a lot of them migrated westward into Ontario and then also over into Wisconsin. In Ontario that's today where you have the largest number of native speakers of Oneida although the language is not that healthy in terms of the number of native speakers today there's probably less than 250. In 1991 it was determined that there were only 250 native speakers, most of them in Ontario here in this region around London in the Thames Valley area. Um, but back to the problem now. So um, here's the data set for the Iroquoian language. The suspicious pair of phones that we're looking at are the S versus the Z. So of course just as we do in any problem the first thing we do is look for minimal pairs. So we go through the data set and have a quick scan and see that, oh, no, none of these words are at all like each other. So the next thing we do is list out the environments in the hopes that we will find some near minimal pairs in the data set. So listing out the environment requires going through each word one by one and finding all the instances of the suspicious phones in question and, tr and listing the immediate phonetic environment which means what comes immediately in front and what comes immediately after each of those uh, instances of the, the phone. So um, while you're taking a few minutes to do that I'll just point out a few of the observations I can make about Oneida in terms of the, the form of the language first thing you might notice is how long some of these words are and how complex some of these words are. For example, isn't that a brilliant word? Uh, which means long words. Yes, Oneida has a lot of long words. In fact, they have a lot of long words which have as much information in them as we would package into a whole sentence and they package all that information into just a single word which is quite common in these indigenous languages of North America. A couple other things to note are um, their use of the voiceless glottal uh, fricative ha. Huh. They have ha huh quite a bit in their language and what is different from English is that they also have ha huh in coda position. So here for one pine tree, skanetat, they have that ha huh at the in coda position after the vowel whereas we typically, well in English we only have it in onset position. Another interesting thing is that they have ha huh in a constant cluster in onset position with stops. So this is not thi, this is tehi, tehiskate. And over here we have um, Kaheize. And that's interesting too with that clustering of vowels, all these vowel nuclei together, which you would have to pronounce each of those vowels. Kaheize. They also have glottal stop quite a bit, um, typically at the end or, well, in, in coda position in different places. So some interesting observations about Oneida. Okay, so we list out all the environments, and this is what your environment chart would look like once it's filled in. Um, next thing we do is look for near minimal pairs and we identify near minimal pairs if we have exactly the same environment in one column as in another column. And very quickly you can see that no we don't have exactly the same environment. They're quite distinct in the types of sounds that occur on either side of su and za. So no minimal pairs and now we have no near minimal pairs. So we have absolutely no evidence for these phones being contrastive, for these phones being understood as totally different phones. Instead, we have to conclude that they are allophones of one phoneme. These are non-contrastive sounds that are actually understood as the same sound. So we have one phoneme in the mind of the native speaker, um, but sometimes pronounced sa and sometimes pronounced za. So two different allophones there. So once we've established that, the last thing we need to do is figure out what the relationship of those allophones is to one another. 
and we're hoping to find complementary distribution, which is the relationship of where separate environments determining the use of s versus z. What we do is we start with the shorter column because it's easier to look for patterns um, when you have fewer items to look through. And very quickly, I'm sure you spotted that we always have z between vowels. You notice that when I write the generalization down below, I actually didn't include the vowel in front. Now, it wouldn't be wrong to put the vowel in front, but you actually don't need that vowel in front. Because it's not the vowel in front that determines the usage of z. It's the fact there's, that there's always a vowel after. Um, the reason for that is because over in the su data set, sometimes we actually do have a vowel in front, but we never, ever, ever have a vowel behind. So it's the fact that it's for z, it's conditioned by a vowel right after it, and su never, ever has a vowel after it. That's why we're allowed to put elsewhere down here. Remember, elsewhere is that mutually exclusive term. That means everywhere else in the environment, apart from the one accounted for for the other phone. So those generalizations then we just transfer over into our rule and we pick the elsewhere allophone. The symbol for the elsewhere allophone becomes the symbol for our phoneme as well. So we have this phoneme S, this S phoneme is realized as Z before vowels and it's realized as S everywhere else. Now, just to make things interesting, they throw another data set at us for the suspicious phone of a sh. And for sh, we don't have so many words, just a few words here. And we need to list out the environments for each instance of sh in that data set. Here are some great words. Teshak, let you break. I love that cluster of the glottal stop and the velar stop at the end there. How about this word? What a great word. Um, they would suddenly separate again. I'm not sure if an Oneida speaker would need that word very much, but if they needed it, that's how they would say it. Okay, so we list out the environments. Um, and when you're listing out environments, you actually don't have to list an environment twice in the same column. So, for example, here there's two different instances of a sh between... Um, I think yes, between a ha and that ya sound in both of these words. So you don't need to list it twice, you just need to list it once in your column there. So here's my listing of environments for sh. And very quickly we spot, oh, it's always a ya after it. So I'm going to add that in to my final rule here. Now here's something else to think about when you have a situation of complementary distribution. Um, usually, the usage of each of these different allophones is, is, well, it's conditioned by the environment, and usually there's some kind of logic behind why you have the different allophones surfacing where they do. So one of the things you should do is always think about how are the allophones different from, from one another. In particular, how are they different from the elsewhere allophone? So how is a z different from a s? Well, of course, that's a difference in voicing and then see how the environment relates to that. We get a z, a voiced allophone, in the environment of always immediately in front of a vowel. And what are vowels? Well, they're always voiced. Their default state is to be voiced. So it's basically an assimilation process where the voicing of the vowel goes in front, a regressive assimilation here of voicing onto the, the fricative. Same idea with the sh. How is a sh different from a sa? Well, they're different in place of articulation. And what is the place of articulation of a sh? Well, it's an alveopalatal, just like the ya. So the alveopalatal nature of the ya influences the choice of the allophone sh rather than sa. So once you've got your full um, listing of the complementary distribution rule, there should be some kind of logic guiding the use of each of these different allophones from one another. So there you have a completed problem, and in this case the solution was allophones of one phoneme in a relationship of complementary distribution.